Good morning. So I spoke to the teens Wednesday night, and I told them, and I think I said it last Sunday in here, this group of lessons has by far uh, been my favorite group of lessons out of these books that I can remember. Um, it is just, it, it, the idea of what our purpose is and doing it is just awesome. We're going to be on page 37 if, you're, if you have the book. Um, today's one, today's is called Purpose Lived. We live out our purpose as we are led and filled with the Spirit is the point of the lesson. Um, I'm going to read the Bible Meets Life because I really enjoyed this one. Um, in 1901, oil was discovered in Texas. Right at the time, America would be, begin craving oil. Prior to this, oil was used chiefly for kerosene lamps, uh, but the dawn of the 20th century brought with it the invention of the internal combustion engine. Cars, planes, and the neighbor, neighbor kids' noisy little motorbike soon followed. Suddenly, we had a great need for oil and lots of it. A lot of Texans were just eking out an existence until oil was discovered. Great wealth lay under the people's land in Beaumont, but it was long, wasn't doing, uh, doing them any good. It wasn't until a mining engineer named Anthony Lucas drilled a well that sent oil gushing a thousand feet in the air. With the oil came prosperity for so many. Most of us live our lives like, the, like it's 1900 in Beaumont, Texas. We're getting by without ever realizing the great potential that rely, re, resides within us. If you're a follower of Christ, he has placed his Holy Spirit in you. The same God who brought this universe to existence and raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you. The question number one on this, I really thought it was kind of cool. It says, uh, what's something people in your hometown, hometown love to brag about? <laughs> what makes Cleveland... What, what makes Cleveland famous? You, if, if somebody came to you and said, what, what's there, what makes Cleveland special? What's the first thing that comes out of your mind? I would probably just say like where Gary and Greg are. Okay. Sean said Lake Erie and the Great Lakes. So when I was driving Lyft and I would pick people up at the airport and they'd say, well, what's Cleveland got to do? Well, I'm here. What do they have? And I'd say, well, you know, we have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which, whatever, if that's your thing. But some of the things people don't know about Cleveland that I always brag about is, one, we have the second largest theater district outside of New York City. We have more theaters and shows going on than any other city in America outside of New York City every day. That's, a, that's, that's something to be proud of. At, the, at a city like ours, still has that. Our museums... Our museums are phenomenal. Our metro parks are one of the best in the nation. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, oh yeah, they're, they're, our, the metro park system is one of the largest and best maintained park systems in the country. It's actually kind of weird when you think about how big it is. I, I guess the reason why I say that is more not, is not because it's just. I mean, I, I guess I haven't been around. Like I'm just thinking, like, like, like you go to other cities, they don't have that. No. A lot of cities and areas don't have the, the park system and the, the natural resource reserve that we have set aside for that. Um, so, you know, whereas, you know, and unfortunately we have too many people in Cleveland that would say, that would brag about the Browns, which, why? You know, my mother would, my mother, when she was alive, would have said the Indians because um, she was a huge baseball fan. <laughs> so, you know, and... So it comes down to, you know, but if you've ever been to Beaumont, Texas, they'll tell you everything about oil and the oil wells. I mean, like, it's one of those cities you've seen on a, on a movie where they're driving through and all it is is just wells. I mean, it just pumps and wells everywhere. They still have oil there? Oh, yeah. It's one of the largest oil. It was, it, it'll never, that area will never run dry. Um, and Miss Lucas is Lucas Oil. Um, Indianapolis Colts play in Lucas Oil Stadium. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 16 through 26 this morning. This is by far one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Um, 
we went through and did a walkthrough in Pyramid a few years ago of this. Um, and I did a, I defined the words as, you, as we went through them. And it was, it's, a, it's an interesting study when you define the words, especially um, in verse 19 through 21, uh, where it talks about the works of the flesh. So, Galatians 5, 16 through 18. Can I get somebody to read those? So, this is, I mean, this is a very simple scripture to understand. It's probably one of the easier ones in this, in this book, this chapter. I mean, you're either walking in the spirit or you're walking in the flesh. You can't do both. It's not possible to do both. God said you cannot serve both God and mammon. You can't do it. You know, later on, I think it's in James. Um, James writes and talks about being lukewarm. God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold because lukewarm does nothing. It serves no purpose. So you cannot say, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ and go to bars and miss church, swear like a sailor. You just can't do it. It it doesn't work. Um, You know, you... I had a conversation with a gentleman at work this week about um, a customer I sold, and uh, we were talking about addiction and alcoholism and stuff. And he's been in pro- he's been in the program for he's been in AA for I think he said 25 years or something like that. And uh, I've been sober for 17. And he said, uh, "So where do you go to meetings?" I said, "Columbia Road Baptist Church." He goes, "Oh, they've got an AA meeting there." I said, "No." And he just looked at me funny. I said, "I go to church." And as long as I'm grounded in this, in church and fellowship and teaching and hearing God's word, I'm okay. I'm good. I have a good foundation that is more and and truer than I'm going to get in any outside addiction program. You know, uh, my very first time in in a rehab, my counselor said, well, if you believe that doorknob is your higher power, it'll work. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. I mean, it just doesn't work. And I say that because there are people that I meet that are in programs that are like, oh, yeah, I believe in God. Okay, but do you? Because if you're not following him, if you're not doing what he says, you really don't believe in him. I mean, if, if Warren Buffett said, I want to sit down with you three hours a week and teach you how to become a millionaire with simple investing tips, would you do it? Yeah, we all would. We'd be stupid not to. But if he came to us and said, listen, I'm going to give you the money to invest. I'm going to show you how to invest it. I'm going to help you make billions of dollars. And you went, okay, but never did anything with it. It's the same thing as saying I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian, but not doing anything with it. Because your eternal rewards aren't there. You have no fruit from what you're saying. When we come to Christ and we, become, we get saved, we get all of the Spirit. You know, we hear people um, on TV, radio, even in sermons sometimes or in prayer, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Then, then you're not saved. If you're waiting to be filled with the Spirit, then, then your salvation is not true. Because the minute you get saved... Paul says right here, you've got the Spirit. You've got God in you. You are 100% filled with the Spirit of God. Don't try to understand it, because it will just scramble your brain trying to understand how that works. Just know that it's true, because God said it's true. So what are we doing with it? So question two here says, what does walking by the Spirit look like? Anybody? Walking, walking by or walking in 
Well, it says walking by, but walking with, walking in the Spirit, however you want to say it. It's, it's kind of simple, you know, when, yeah, that's pretty much it. If God says to do it and you do it and God says, don't do it and you don't do it, you're walking in the spirit. You're being obedient. You're allowing the spirit to thrive inside you. When you don't do it, when you go against what God says and you're doing everything wrong, then you quench the spirit. You, you push the spirit down. Usually that's where you'll see a Christian follow somebody who is safe, fall away and get involved in drugs and alcohol because the conviction has to be uh, put away. And, and, and alcohol and drugs is the fastest way to do that. Um, doesn't work, but it's the fastest way to attempt it. I'm going to read Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Um, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, does that mean anybody who's ever done those things is not going to heaven? No. It means those people who live doing those things and never ask for forgiveness and are not Christian, have never asked for forgiveness or salvation, those people who live that life will not, be, will not go to heaven. Um, does anybody know what the fastest growing religion in Northeast Ohio is right now? Oh, there's two that are challenging each other. One, Wiccan. Yes. No. Fast, fast is growing. Wiccan is one. There are more covens and d- d- storefront covens opening up around Northeast Ohio than there are churches. Than there are churches, and there are more churches closing. The second one is, uh, uh, oh my goodness, I can never remember that what they call it. Basically, it's it's the belief in Thor and Odin. Um, it's it's that Viking men mentality and Valhalla, that, that warrior spirit um, ideology, because it says you can do whatever you want as long as you are willing to fight for it. Um, huge group, um, a friend of mine's a chaplain in the uh, National Guard, he said that's, he goes, I, he goes, I had to learn what that was, he goes, because I have so many people coming to me and asking questions about it, because it's so hard for me just not to look at him and go, you're an idiot. <laughs> What? Why would you even think that? Why, why would you even, how can you even possibly follow that ideology? But they do. Because it, re- it relieves them of condemnation and uh, that what they're doing is wrong. It, it tells them anything you want to do is okay. So it's, they want to do it. Um, the most of, a lot of these sins in here um, are what we are under attack by more than anything, which is sexual sins. Um, with the, you know, I read an, uh, an article the other day, and it said the average boy, um, average boy in America starts watching pornography at the age of eight. The average girl is watching it at twelve. Our children are becoming more relaxed to sexual sin than America has ever been before because honestly it's this right here it's so easy to go on it and just watch whatever you want to watch Um, you know social media Um, I don't know about you guys if you have it or not but I mean I get probably 15 20 different messages a week from programs they're, 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 that, hey, come look at that. Nope, block, nope, block, you know, and it's crazy. I, I, it's, it's insanity how, how the devil attacks us at our weakest places. 
Um, I don't get really with alcohol anymore. I really don't have issues and struggles where I sit there and think, man, I just, I, you know, I want to go drink. I, I really don't, I don't struggle with that much anymore. God has been grace, graceful to me in that. Um, but there are other areas of my life that the devil attacks me in. Um, and that's because of my past. Question three. What are consequences of tolerating works of the flesh in our lives? What's a consequence of tolerating the works of the flesh? Well, I mean, you just have to think, like, I mean, you know, sin itself is destructive. So, like, you know, like, I, you know, I think the Lord says, you know, you're transgressing and you're tired and whatnot. It's like, you know, things are going to be hard. Like, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that those are the things that go up, but I'm just saying you're gonna you, you could you're gonna face hardship. Yes, you will. Um, there's a gentleman who runs a ministry called Fallen in Grace. Um and he uh what it does is he actually works with pastors and church leaders who have become who got involved in mostly sexual sins, um things like that, alcohol, drugs, whatever. Um, fell from grace, were removed from the pulpit, um, but repented and need to rest- help restoring themselves, uh, getting restored back to service. Because one of the things that churches, church members and people in churches are really good at is remembering every sin you did wrong. People are really good at remembering what you did wrong and holding it forever. I mean, I, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Now, if you are an unrepentant person, it should be held against you, completely and totally. But once you are repentant, once you are forgiven by God, I think of David uh, when he begged for forgiveness from God, you know, begged for forgiveness of his sin. He, he, he begged God for forgiveness. God forgave him, and he moved on. And, and, and in reality, that's the kind of way it should be. Somebody comes to us, and they say, listen, I did this, 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 or whatever. I have sinned. I've asked God for forgiveness. He's forgiven me. Now I want to work to restore my testimony. We should do everything in our power as a church body to raise them up and help them become a, a fruitful member of the church again. I, I, I believe that wholeheartedly is our job as a church. Um, but we don't do that. We're not... <laughs> um, Circumstances for to- consequences of tolerating works of the flesh. Look at our society. Our churches have tolerated the works of the flesh for so long that now we have pulpits preaching homo- that Jesus was a homosexual. It happens every day. We have people preaching um, that you don't have to follow the Bible if you don't personally agree with it. There's a a, a preacher, I use the term preacher loosely, I will never call him a pastor. Um, I heard on the radio the other day, or it might have been on YouTube, a clip of him or something, and he said, the Bible is an interpretive book. Interpret it however you need to. So God will love you. And I went, what? I mean, that's like me telling my kids to clean their room and them going, okay, so what exactly did dad mean by clean my room? I think he meant this. Then me going in and going, hey, I told you to clean your room. Well, I did. Oh, okay. It doesn't work. Authority is authority, and, and, and the understanding of authority. I, when I was talking to the teens the other night, I said, you know, I said, the Bible is the perfect authority. Anything in a church 
or religious setting that disagrees with that book is wrong. It cannot be right. I said, you know, there are parts of the Bible that I still question where I'm reading and I'm like, wait a minute, that's a contradiction. But then I stop and I remember that, you know, compared to God, I'm an idiot. I know nothing. And I have to search it now. And it forces me to go back and search everywhere I think it's a contradiction to prove, my, prove to myself that it's not a contradiction. And that's what I was challenging them. I said, you know, our purpose as we go through this, and it's why I love these, this lesson, because it's talking about our purpose in Christ. This whole lesson is what is our purpose now that we're Christians? What is our purpose to be on this earth? You know, when Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Our purpose of life is Christ. Our purpose of life is to spread the gospel. Our purpose is to be a follower evident of Christ. Where people look at you and say, that's a Christian. You know, when you're at work and everybody talks about going out for drinks after work and they're like, hey, don't even talk to them about it. They don't, they don't want to go. They don't do this. They don't do those kind of things. You know, at work this week, they were doing a, a uh, they had some Browns tickets they were giving away. And somebody goes, hey, you going to try to get those? I'm like, no. Nope. I said, I'm not missing church to go to a Browns game, first of all. <laughs> I said, and second of all, I couldn't tell you last time I sat down and watched a game. I used to. When, when we first got married, Saturdays and Sundays, leave me alone. I mean, I would go to church on Sunday morning. I was home in my chair on Sunday afternoon, you know, watching games, go to church, come home, watch Sunday night football. Um, Saturdays was college. I mean, I didn't care if it was a MAC team. I was still watching it. Uh, I couldn't tell you last time I sat down and watched a game. Now, Marie and I will sit down during hockey season, and we'll watch a hockey game here and there. Um, but if it's not my team, I really don't care to, about it. It's not that important to me. Um, and that, to me, is, is evident of the change that God has made. We don't have to give up. We don't give up everything right away when we get saved. You know, you see people, they'll come into church, and they've got, you know, they're wearing these clothes or doing this or they look this certain way and they got piercings and this, that, and the other. They get saved and within two weeks, they're coming in wearing, looking like they're Amish because somebody told them that the way they dress, the way they look, the way this was all inappropriate. It is not the job of the church to do that. It's not. It's the job, that's the Holy Spirit and God's job. Our job is to say, here's Jesus, here's what the Bible says, and let conviction work. Because usually when somebody comes in and they make that dramatic change in their life right away, where they just flip the script, within six months they're out of the building. Because they never learned how to have joy in a new life. And that joy and happiness in a new life is where we're going to go into next. That really, truly, and honestly to me, is what is the Christian life is all about. So Galatians uh, 5, 22 to 26. <clears throat> but the fruit of the Spirit is love. I love that it starts there. Because love is the core of, of being a Christian. God's love towards us is why Christ came and died in the first place. So we should love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, side, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then joy. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and the lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be the serious of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. When I've heard people pre teach and preach that when you get saved, you get the fruits of the Spirit. I don't agree with that. I, I just don't. I believe fruit comes from growth. I believe we are the vine, just as Christ says, grafted in, 
And as we grow, as we mature, as we study His Word, we then will get fruit of the Spirit in our lives, which will help us get fruit for heaven. In other words, leading people to Christ. There will be a testimony about us that people look at and go, what in the world is different about them? You know, um, we talk about death um, a lot in our society. Death as a Christian, and when you know someone who was saved who died, it's such a joy. Sure, or do we mourn their loss that we're, they're not in our lives anymore? Yes. But we don't mourn them. If anything, we're, we, we should have a jealousy of them because they're already with Christ. They're already perfected in heaven. And that's a joy that we get to have as Christians that the unsaved world cannot understand. Um, love. You know, a lot of people want to say, oh, we just got to learn how to... Love is tolerating. It's, it's learning how to accept people for who they are and what they are. No, that's not biblical. The love of Christ says God loves you as a person. He hates what you're doing. He hates sin. He hates it when I sin, which I still sin. God hates that sin. But thankfully, he loves you, and he loves me, and he wants to forgive us. You know, it, the grace of God and his mercy is probably, next to the Trinity, the most amazing thing that cannot be understood by the human mind. It cannot be understood. You, you cannot fathom it. You just have to accept that it is. Um, there's a new song out called Grace, is, Grace Ain't Fair. Because it wasn't fair to Christ. <laughs> Grace was not fair to Christ. But to him, it was. I mean, if you were the only person who ever lived, he still would have come to this earth and died so he could have you. That's, that's craziness to me. He would have let you put him to death so that you could believe in him and be saved. That's his grace. And I can't, I can't grasp that, that. That's in the human mind. That's, you know, but that's love. That, that is the ultimate love of God. When God talks about love your, love your Lord, love the Lord your God as your, with all your heart, mind, and soul, and body. That's what he's talking about. When he says love your neighbor, that's what he's talking about. He's saying, listen, you may disagree with them. You may not like them. You may not, but you should love them enough to go to them and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Hey, let me invite you to church. Hey, let me tell you what makes my life different. If you are unwilling to tell people about Christ, you are condemning them to death and hell. That is not love. We cannot say we love one another when we condemn people to hell by not telling them about Christ. Now, that being said, if you tell people about Christ and they refuse to accept it, that's on them then. You've shown the love. They're the ones who don't want to accept it. Long-suffering. Probably one of the fruits of the Spirit that most Christians do not have. We are not a long-suffering people. We, are, we, we love to just go to people and tell them where they're wrong instead of letting the Lord do His work. Um, it, it's hard. Um, so I challenge you to take this verse and do a word breakdown of every one of the fruits and study them out and learn what they mean. Um, I enjoyed our study when we did it in Pure Men. Um, I still have all my notes from it. It's actually kind of... Fun. Um, I'm a big definer of words. I believe the, the meaning of words is important when you're studying the Bible. And what, this, what, the, the, what the meaning of those words were in 1611 when it was translated. Not what it means today. 
So on the, in our book, there's actually a page here, um, and it's got all the fruits of the spirits, and then at the bottom it's got my prayer. They do this a lot where they want you to um, literally write out a prayer. Um, and pray it as you're, basically you pray it as you're writing it. And the idea is that in doing so, you're going to put the thought into it um, more because you're going to think as you're writing. Um, and it's to help you understand and, get, and be able to grow these gifts, which, as a Christian, we should want them all. Um, question four. This is an interesting one, and I, I'm hoping to get a couple different answers because I know we've got some people in here who've been saved for a while and some new people. What are some habits that help you crucify the flesh? So, for instance, me, with my uh, uh, addiction issues and so forth, when I first got back into church, my big thing that helped me crucify the flesh, because I wasn't working because nobody would hire me. I was unemployable for, a very, for quite some time. Um, literally every day, well, for the first 90 days, I was in AA meetings. I just lived at, an AA, at a, a sobriety home, uh, building. But after that, the pastor of the church where I started going to um, literally would call me and be like, hey, I'm headed to the church. I'm coming by to pick you up. Uh, okay, what are we doing? I don't know. I'll find something for you to do today. Um, and I did. I, I just did stuff at the church every day um, until God said, hey, I'm going to give you this job. And, he get, and, you know, and from there, it was, it was God gave me work. But, you know, I helped. They have a wood ceiling. It's slatboard ceiling. I stained all the wood by hand and then helped me and one and two other guys helped got went in and hung it all um all i did was lift it up i let them do the nailing and cutting because i can't cut straight to save my life um but you know that was what it was i crucified my flesh of being having nothing to do and saying well i might as well go drink and do something stupid by finding something to do it's very much the same way still to this day um, if I'm starting to get to the point to where I don't know what to do, I just ask my wife, she'll give me a list of things I can do. Um, or I call, I'll call Pastor Steve or I'll call Pastor Bill and be like, hey, what needs to be done up at the church? Or I'll just grab my leaf blower and come up here like very soon. We're going to have the entire parking lot full of leaves. You know, come up with leaf blowers and just keep blowing them out and getting rid of them. So those are things that, you know, help me. What are some of the things you do to help you crucify the flesh? I think I can probably answer the first one. Um, so we spend a lot of time outside. Mm -hmm. And we actually just talked the other day. We were going outside and Mike said, can you believe there, were, there was a time where years passed that we did not open this back door and go outside? And I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't even think about that. But something during COVID, you know, we were just like, we're cooped up. And we started going outside and just literally sitting out in the sun. And we would do a lot of, like, birds and, you know, there's little groundhogs that run through the yard. And we'll just admire and watch, you know, God's creation. And we'll laugh at the way the animals are interacting together. And, yeah, the squirrel, we feed the squirrel peanuts. <laughs> you know, it's just. Don't do that. It's bad. It's bad for them. Yes. Uh, there. Uh, yeah, I read a whole thing on that because we have we feed deer. We have a deer feeder in our backyard, and uh, the squirrels were coming and they were eating the corn. And the thing said that we shouldn't feed them corn, peanuts, things like that. If you want to give them peanut butter, their bodies have problems producing the hard, which is kind of weird because they eat acorns like it's cool. Believe me, they bury them all over my yard. I end up, I get little, we get little oak trees popping up everywhere in fall. Ugh, Sean. I mean, one thing that I've done, um, I guess it kind of works as a like, physical exercise, like especially like, I mean, in some sense, it can be crucial. I mean, don't get me wrong, it can be kind of an idol to go to one extreme. Right. But like, if you're like. It's just that thought of like my body does not want to go harder or further, but you're going to make it do it anyway. And in some sense, that is crucifying. 
wholeheartedly it is. Um, so Maddie brought up the fact that since COVID, they go outside more and they're in their yard and they couldn't remember when they opened their back door prior to that. And Sean talked about his exercise. As some of you know, Sean does triathlons because he's insane. Um, but, you know, he'll push himself even further. And, and, and it's, you know, training for events like that, I, I believe, is cruising, uh, crucifying the flesh because it's not just physically, but it's also diet. You have to train yourself and you have to be willing to give up things to do it. Um, you know, I, I lately have been, I'm getting very convicted about exercise um, and my lack thereof. Um, and it's something that I, I, I battle with, but I have to, I know it's something I've got to do because I'm getting to that point to where, you know, the diabetes and stuff are going to start to become a, a something that they're going to start really watching for. You know, I've hit the, I've, I, I, I crossed the line at 260 and it's like, okay, time to start losing some weight, you know, but I really need to get down to that 200 marker under. Um, and my wife would be very happy if I did. But that's, you know, that's something where, like, food for me is huge. I love to eat. I mean, it is like, oh, it's such a wonderful thing. I love that we live in, I, could, I couldn't fathom living in a third world country where I, I didn't have food at, 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 ad nauseum. I mean, I went to, like I said, I went to Larry's banquet the other night. And I don't know if you've ever been to an Amish family-style restaurant banquet. So... The room is set up, and it's literally 50 long, 50 long tables, okay? Um, so it's just a whole banquet hall, 200 plus. I think, it was, I think there were 212 people in there. And they come out to the end of the tables, and so, like, these would be tables, these would be tables. And what they do is they come out, and they stand here, and they've got a, a tray, like a cart, that's got plates of food on it. And they start at one end, and then they go to the other side, and they start. And they pass these plates around the table. And you just get to put one on your plate, whatever you want. I mean, we're talking good fried chicken. You know, you can tell it's cooked in lard, like it's supposed to be. You know, roast beef that falls apart in your mouth. Uh, mashed potatoes, green beans with bacon in it. You know, I'm going to make everybody hungry sitting here talking about it. But it's this whole meal. And then guess what they do? They come around again. And then after that, you know what they do? They come around again. <laughs> so about the third plate, I'm sitting there and my plate is, the third plate was just fried chicken. I like put like three thighs and two legs on there. And I'm eating it and I'm just, I mean, it was just, and the lady sitting next to me goes, really? And I said, what? She goes, do you even have a clue of how many calories you're putting in your body? I said, I don't even care. My doctor told me I could have all the meat I want. I have to cut my carbs because this is all carb weight. So I was eating all the protein. I had one roll. They were really good, though. They were really hot when they came out. Butter. I mean, was, that's my, right now, that's my great struggle. Food is my great struggle. I love food, you know, and it's kind of funny because my wife is like, oh, I'll eat if I have to. I mean, I came home yesterday. She had been out in the yard working all day doing stuff, and I looked at her, and I said, uh, did you eat? She goes, well, I haven't had dinner yet. Now, mind you, it's like 730, and I'm like, when did you eat lunch? She goes, before I came out here to start work, working in the yard at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, you, you can't do that. Your body needs that nutrition at some point in there. But to her, it wasn't even a, you know, thought. Then she had one French bread pizza and she was good to go. <laughs> I'm like, please, I'm, I wanted to order a pizza for myself. Um, like a large pizza. Yeah. But that's, how do you crucify the flesh? For me, that is the big thing I have to work on. And so if I'm not going to curb my diet, I have to start exercising. I have to do one of two things right now that I hate to do. Now, Sean was talking about running. I love to run. Loved it. Can't do it, though. My knee is fried. I run around the block and my knee will swell up like a balloon. 
It's what happens when you have multiple surgeries on it. So I had to find another exercise to do. And that's something I have to work on because I really would love to get back into my suits. I have a whole closet full of suits that are like here. Pants I can't even, I don't even try to put them on. So question five is what aspects of the fruit of the Spirit do you need him to grow in you? So when we look at the fruits of the Spirit and we go back to uh, 5.22 uh, through 26, and you see those fruits of the Spirit, what is the one that you think God, that you would like to see God grow in you? What's a fruit you would love to see become prominent in your life? Is it love? Is it joy? Is it peace? I mean, are, 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 do you have everything and you're, you're good to go? I mean, are the fruits of the Spirit flowing out of you on a daily basis? So think about what you would love to see change in your life and pray for that. Pray for that improvement and that, that fruit to grow. Um, think of it like the, the parable where, uh, the story where Christ was talking about uh, the tree that was bearing no fruit. And the, the husband, and co- the, the owner of the, gro- of the trees, comes, orchard comes to him and says, tells the husband, cut it down, throw it into the fire. And the husband says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let me prune it, let me dung it, let me fertilize it, let me get it, you know, let's give it another year to see if it grows fruit. Is that where you're at with Christ? Are you willing to look at God when he says, okay, you know what, you're just not getting it. Are you willing to say, wait a minute, hang on, hang on. Give me, another, give me more time. I, I, want to do, I want this, Lord. Help me, help me get there. Help me find out how to do this. Lead me how to get to find love. Lead me to find joy. Lead me to have peace in my life. You know, they say uh, um, the greatest evidence of peace in your life is how quickly you can fall asleep at night. When you lay your head on your pillow, do you have peace and are able to go to sleep? Or are you thinking about everything that you didn't get done, that you've got to do? Or are you saying, you know what, I got peace. It's in God's hands. He's going to take care of it. I've given it to God. He's going to help me figure it out. Um, I think too many Christians today and I can speak for this personally, love to say, Lord, I really need you to help me figure this out after I tell you how I want to do it. Doesn't work that way. He says, I've already got it figured out, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. As long as you're willing to do it, it's going to be cool. So this week, think about the fruits of the Spirit. Think about... What, where you're at, what is your, um, you know, where are your struggles at with the Spirit? Do you believe and understand and accept fully that you have 100% of the Holy Spirit in you? Pastor Bill does not have any more Spirit, Holy Spirit in him than you do. He has the exact same amount that you do, 100%. And it's insane to think about that. So what are you going to do with it? What are we going to do to make Christ's church better? Make Christ's church grow? Make fruit abundant to our account? These are the things that this, these, that's why I, why I said earlier when we started, I really have enjoyed these lessons. Because it is making me think about and focus on my purpose. Why, with all the things I've done in my life, as many times as I was supposed to die, I didn't. Why am I still here? Why is the purpose God has intended for me? And I think about that, and it's, it's one of those things, as I, that's why I, say I love studying this lessons, because it has tr- really made me do a reset on some of the things and, that I've thought and the, the ideas I've had. Um, I, I, I say, you know, 
the years I was out running around doing stupid stuff, there's no reason I'm standing here today. None. Zero. Other than God was like, no, no, I got something planned for you. I'm going to use you. You're not, I'm not done with you yet. I'm going to do something to you that's going to get your attention eventually. And he did. It involved jail and me losing everything. And then him saying, okay, now here's a piece to restore it. Here's a piece. Here's a piece. Here's a piece. Here's a piece. Um, and I'm a, I am overly blessed with what God has done in my life the last 15 years. Overly. I, I don't deserve any of it. And that's why I believe these lessons as we go through them are so wonderful. Um, next week's lesson is called Purpose Expressed. It's really, an, I, I've already read through most of these um, it, from lesson one when Harold taught. Um, so it was, uh, but yeah, I really have enjoyed these and it's, this will be one of the books that I keep at home on my desk and go back and revisit these lessons because I think if, we, if you revisit these lessons periodically, it will help you stay grounded in why God, why God is God and what his purpose for us is. Does anybody have anything as we close? All right, Sean, you want to lead, uh, say a prayer and uh, we'll get out of here? Mm-hmm.